The Monerotopia Price Report segment is sponsored by Local Monero. Avoid using KYC exchanges. Buy and sell Monero directly for fiat, peer to peer. Aloha. Good morning. What's going on, man? Good morning. Good morning. Well, nothing going? much. Just playing with tech problems. <laughs> we, it's we a feel constant you. struggle. It's we a constant feel struggle. <laughs> I thought I had all my sound issues fixed, and there was no, like it's... one small thing, so I had to default back to the regular. So I can like hear my voice on a half second loop right here. <laughs> so, that's annoying. So if I sound oh, hesitant, that's why. Do you have you have headphones on, obviously? Yeah, yeah, I got all that. Um, if I it's something specific to Chromium and StreamYard combined. Because when I use something like Jitsi or anything else, I don't have the same problem. So <laughs> I was gonna try and split them out. Um, where I was basically my voice was joining from one browser that was not uh, Chromium. And then my charts are gonna be from a different browser, but that's I don't know, it just wasn't working this morning. So well, you're asking the wrong wrong people. So, <laughs> so totally. good luck. It's a <laughs> constant <laughs> struggle for us. So <laughs> Yeah. It's funny, you'd think after like two decades of this, it would just be seamless by now. Right. Uh, it's Should, painful. Yeah. Things take longer than expected. Well, it's great to hear the yeah. show, uh the Venerotopia. Uh, conference is coming along that well. Oh yeah, yeah man. it's, it's going to be epic. I mean, the only thing is, uh, we want we want to try to get a bunch of locals. Uh, any ideas you have, man, to get the word out? Um, like we, we set that ticket price to only twenty five bucks. So um, hypothetically, we could hit the ground, send a group of people that are already local, already familiar with Monero, and then go maybe a month ahead of time to Mexico yes. City and just um, start recruiting people from the streets. Yeah, streets yeah. or even like schools. Someone mentioned actually like universities. Yeah, yeah, like the, the local the university. Main, yeah, well, look, like we, the computer science programs there, or any like yep. people that you think might like have some sort of interest. That's a good idea, really man. Good. We'll, we'll we'll coordinate with you. I mean, I don't know if you're ca capable of heading over there, but we we have to head over there anyway before. So we're thinking of doing it as soon as um, early March, right? Yeah, we might head over there because we gotta we gotta make sure we gotta talk to the venue again, make sure everything's seamless and ironed out. Uh, so maybe we'll do it at that time, and then we yeah, have that's the, a really good idea. Yeah, so the it's kind of loose in Mexico, so you, you really have to yeah, and then follow. Like, yeah, yeah, we're we're not <laughs> taking chances with this, so we're gonna go down there, have you know, personal meetings again, more more handshakes. Yeah, maybe, give them more, more money. Be like, Here's the final payment. Just don't <laughs> don't, don't screw us over. Because then everyone's gonna be hanging out outside of this venue. They're so <laughs> lax about it. They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we know. We're like, okay, <laughs> yeah, know. it doesn't inspire confidence sometimes. Yeah. But so we'll probably do that, and then when we're down there, we'll we'll hustle around trying to get the word out locally. We're gonna hire somebody um, locally to print up flyers and like the posters and put them up. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe that will help a little bit. Yeah, but I, I think that's idea. a great idea about going down to um, various engineering schools and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, someone mentioned that the other day. I was like, oh yeah, that's right. You know, there's a bunch of schools there. I think. Very yeah. What? Once again, anybody who's local to Mexico City, if you're listening, reach out. Please do email us. Monerotopia, protonmail.com if you want to help out in any way with uh, getting the word out. All right, man. Take it away with prices. Take it away, as my Exciting friend. as ever, right? Okey doke. Yeah, price is doing really good. Um, so I guess we'll start with Bitcoin today. And everything looks really good. Let's go to the weekly. Oh, actually, that's total. All right, here we go. Bitcoin. So I always like to start with the zoomed out view as usual. So we can get our bearings for some of these lines so that we don't feel too schizophrenic. So you've got this um, this lower line down here, and it's basically it's like the only way you could really draw this line that uh, would be all that meaningful. Maybe we could try and draw this line that I just drew as well. Um, but you know, I do like this connection point down here. We cut through the secondary low, touched the March 2020 crash, and so we're going to zoom in. But now you can have your bearing for what that line is down there, why it's important. Um, and then we've got kind of our various bear market resistance lines here. And the very last one that we could draw, like the most shallow way we could draw this is to connect uh, these points right here. And then so that's basically where we just barely broke. Uh, I think that was yesterday we broke that. So um, a lot of people were saying, uh, oops, let's go back to the daily. A lot of people were saying that this wick right here was just a blow off wick. To me, that does not look like a blow off wick, a blow -off wick at all. So um, everything's looking really good here. You can see that um, this was our like, pre-doom FTX crash levels, which is why I have this horizontal line drawn here. And last week we were talking about how we got up to this area, it was resistance, and then we were hanging down at the very top of this range just before FTX broke down. So the fact that we bounced off that level so strongly is such a good sign. 
Now, probably there was a little bit of help from the market makers to make sure that happened. Um, but what does that tell you, right? It tells you that they want to paint the chart in a way that inspires confidence. And they haven't really been painting the chart this way for the last year. And my guess is because the leverage was unwinding, they knew that um, things were going to go down further. So we can go down to a little bit shorter time frames. Um, yeah, you can basically see that we essentially regained that channel, that kind of uh, rising grind line that we were in for really since early January. Um, right now, my anticipation would be that we probably consolidate in this range for a while. And with the potential that we might actually pop above that and then really go, go off to the races. Um, the pre, the August pump, the top of the August pump would be right here, that dotted line I just drew. And technically, we just ever so slightly got above that. So it's not really a break, but that does inspire some confidence, again, that we actually got above that line. Um, so everything looks really nice right now. Uh, if you remember last week, I was saying that this is probably a good opportunity to pick up some positions. If you didn't get long back in early January, this is basically the dip that you're looking for. Um, so hope, hope people bought uh, extra coins there, um, particularly their ship coins. Uh, we'll get to Monero in a bit. I know it's, Monero hasn't been entirely inspiring uh, in its price, but um, it's, it's not that bad. Okay, so here's total. And total is basically the same story as Bitcoin. Uh, we've got kind of our various bear market resistance lines. Um, the, the difference here with total is that it took us a lot more time to get above that pre-doom, the FTX doom levels. Um, so we stayed there, basically couldn't get above, couldn't confirm above that level. Um, you can kind of see that, like, technically we had a couple closes above, but every time they kept falling back down. But this time we finally strongly broke it, bounced off, and then came back up. So that's all really good. Like, that's very, it's exactly what you want to see um, if you're going to try and make the bull case. So at every moment, we've just been able to see continued strength. And I really do think this should continue overall for at least the next month or so, maybe even longer. Uh, just to be clear, though, I don't think this is like the real bull market. I think this is like a 2019 echo boom. Um, at some point, I do believe later this year, we're going to have to come back down, contend with the lows, maybe 20K-ish. Um, but we'll get that, you know, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Uh, we can also take a look at Bitcoin dominance. Now, I drew a few lines down here. Um, for now, we'll ignore the descriptive statistics. So you can see what's happening here. Uh, it's easier if we go to the daily. Yeah. Okay, so this is basically when the bull market really kicked off and really all the shit coins kicked off uh, in May of 2021. And then Bitcoin has just been range bound uh, between this lower line down here and obviously this upper line right around just below 50%. So you can see that there's this um, there's this line right here and it kind of was a trend line and then it started going parabolic, right? Every time you have to redraw this line. So at the moment, I would basically expect Bitcoin dominance to keep running. Um, it wouldn't be surprising to see this make all the way back up to the top of this range here. Um, the other thing that would tend to support that is looking at the Ethereum Bitcoin ratio. So there's a, a big fundamental thing happening with Ethereum that could drive some relative price performance towards Bitcoin over the next um, about a month. So everyone probably remembers the merge back from August. And the problem is that they went to proof of stake, but no one could move their stakes. Everyone's stakes were locked and everyone knew that that was going to be the case going into it. Um, so they're finally getting around to unlocking stakes. They already released to their first test net. They're supposed to release to their other test net on the 28th of this month. And then after that, sometime in March, everyone's stakes should be unlocked. Now, these are people that have had their stakes locked for like, I think it's been a year and a half. Um, maybe it's two years. Um, at any rate, these are people that have seen their stakes locked for a long time through a brutal bear market. So it is reasonable to expect that some of these people are probably going to bounce out and cash out. Um, I mean, even if you don't want to, sometimes life just gets in the, just gets in the way and you just have to sell. Um, so overall, that should be like a bearish fundamental approaching Ethereum's price right now, um, or at least relatively speaking um, towards Bitcoin. The other thing is that you can see we've got the very long term chart and this very obvious line that we can draw right here. Um, we're basically writing on that. So long time, hit it, hit it, and then the time frame between touching this line is compressing. 
So this very much looks like a line that would tend to break down right here. And that doesn't mean that um, that it's doom for the ratio, which is you know all the all the Ethereum doom porn that probably the maxis love to engage in. But at any rate, we should pretty much expect this to break down. You can see that it already kind of barely is breaking down. Um, so that's kind of another reason why I'd expect Bitcoin dominance to continue performing right here. I would imagine that there is a possibility that this could be temporarily bearish. And then people will say, oh my God, here's my opportunity to get into Ethereum and I can even stake and make X percent. And then I can move my stake whenever I want. So there's no danger that it's locked there. And you might see kind of a violent reaction. So we could see some kind of like breakdown here, um, maybe find some bottom. I don't know, it could be here, it could be here, right? Maybe it even goes all the way down to this line somewhere. But um, overall, I don't think this spells doom for Ethereum. It's kind of like, in my mind, the final test that we need to see that proof of stake is actually viable for Ethereum and it's not just going to totally destroy the network. When everyone's stakes are unlocked and everyone has a chance to leave, if the network is surviving and it's fine and they're not having like weird attacks or anything, we see that happen for, let's just say, six months. Um, there's a very good chance that Ethereum actually did it. They actually made it to proof of stake. Now, there, I know there's a lot of philosophical objections and whatnot, but it's more like a survival thing. Like, will sur uh, Ethereum survive? So I think that the answer to that should be yes. I mean, at a minimum, these guys are really smart. And I do think that they have the support of a lot of traditional finance. I do think a lot of traditional finance would prefer to move some of these legacy financial systems onto something like a distributed virtual machine. Um, that still would be many years away. They have to stress test everything, which is part of this whole DeFi craziness. They have to play finance. Um, but we're going to see DeFi round two whenever the real bull market kicks off. And that'll probably be maybe next year. Uh, we'll see. We have to play it by ear. It's really hard to call anything farther out than a few months um, or maybe six to nine months at, at most. Um, so as I say, you know, we'll reevaluate in real time. So yeah, this is why I think Bitcoin dominance will continue performing. Uh, so that's kind of like the overall broad crypto market. Uh, Monero is continuing like kind of a slow, steady movement up. Um, it's not going up as much as everything else. And one of the reasons you can see very clearly is that for the past few days, uh, all of the exchanges have kind of been in negative price divergences. So essentially they're selling Monero at lower prices than Kraken, and they're selling a decent amount of it. So um, again, as I've said over and over again, I believe this is largely a psychological game. Uh, they've proven that they're out of Monero. So they, they've had to go through these cycles where they acquire. We get really good, strong price performance. Typically, when the crypto markets are not very exciting, um, we'll see the exchanges grab, uh, scoop up a bunch of Monero. So for example here, we just went to the rolling 10 day average of this chart. And you can see that for quite a while, for pretty much all of this year, um, let's zoom out a little bit, make this easier to see. Uh, so Binance is in red and, and I tend to put more weight on Binance. The other exchanges are, I mean, Binance isn't reliable either, but if they're not reliable, the other ones are like, how much worse are they? Um, so at any rate, you can basically see that Binance went into positive divergences for most of the year, kind of came back to even, and then they made some kind of reaccumulation um, not too long ago, but then this slope down is kind of the last few days of them. Just, um, I think they're slightly suppressing price right here, but they only did it uh, because they were able to accumulate, which kind of pushed price up. And my thinking is they love to accumulate during the quiet times, trying to keep the psychology and the sentiment um, quiet about that. And then when they start pumping price with the leverage, with the stable coins, with, uh, with the hype, whatever, um, then they kind of slowly dump that into Monero to try and limit those price increases. And that creates psychological effects. And um, I saw some of them actually yesterday on XMR trigger. So um, it's just a reality. We, we just have to accept that. Um, but I mean, I really, I really am not worried for Monero. I think everything is quite strong. There's another factor that could be weighing here on Monero's price just a little bit. Uh, darknet markets have been largely shut down. Um, they've been having a lot of problems. Law enforcement has been getting the upper hand on that, uh, on that constant battle. So that could be having an effect here. Uh, there might not be quite so much demand for buying and using Monero. Um, we'll see. Uh, I can't remember someone, someone on Reddit or maybe on Twitter, one of the Monero peeps was talking about their speculation on which next darknet might be the big one. Um, so at any rate, we, we still are above the 006 levels on the, uh, on the ratio. And so, uh, oh, my line, oh, there it is. Okay. 
So let's go to the weekly. This is starting to get too cramped. Okay, so at the bottom here, this was our like our bear market, our last bear market, um, and we're still sitting above those levels right here. So uh, as we talked about, after we broke down this wedge, um, this structure right here, it seems very plausible uh, plausible that we might have to come down and visit this line right here. So we'll see how that goes. Um, I mean, again, this is why I go play in the degeneracy, right? They drove me over there. Um, <laughs> What is that? What is that line? What is the number? The ratio? Oh, this line at 006. So 0.06% of Bitcoin's price. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's why my lines are acting weird. I got to zoom back in. There we go. Um, yeah, it is what it is. Yeah. What are you going to do? You're going to play the, the degenerate shitcoin game and then roll those profits into Monero. That's what I like to do. Um, so at the moment, we've got this like broadening structure right here. Um, so very likely to imagine that we're going to come back up to the top, um, particularly if the rest of crypto continues performing. Now, it could be the case that we might need um, some consolidation time. Like we, uh, well, let's not get that one, skip Bitcoin. Because Bitcoin's, you know, probably going to be one of the better performers, at least of the OG coins. Yeah, so before we break this um, this August top right here, it seems likely that, you know, we might need to get here and kind of hang out, maybe break that uh, that channel right there, and then um, at some point get above that. And that's kind of when the smart money might end up being forced to buy, the quote-unquote smart money. I was listening to a really popular podcast, um, and these guys are like uh, venture capitalists and whatnot. And one of them has connections into like traditional finance and family offices and smart money. And he was saying that um, this pump across stocks and crypto and everything, it took all of the smart money by surprise. None of them expected it. And he said, and now all of them are saying they're going to have to buy higher. Um, and I, I really do think that that's on purpose. Uh, I do think that market makers um, love to accumulate at times that seem unlikely um, and then sort of force the rest of retail and smart money to sort of augment the trade that they already made. So in this case right here, um, they were basically accumulating. They put a floor on the market right here. And then they spent this time accumulating and people doubt this pump. They expect it to go down. The shorters get wrecked. Uh, and then it pumps again. And then right around here, you start seeing smart money say, oh, crap, the chart structure has changed. Um, the TA has changed. Maybe it's time for us to get back in. So I, I do think that's on purpose. Uh, you just kind of have to be aware that those games are happening. Uh, the funny thing is um, some people will be like, they'll be like, everything is manipulation and the price is totally controlled. And I, I 100% don't believe that. It's a factor. It's a big factor. Um, but retail um, and a lot of the smart money, traditional money, they do make up a significant component. And um, you just kind of have to understand that there's multiple things in play. Now, let's go look at stocks. Uh, the S&P is doing pretty good. The NASDAQ is doing pretty good. So you can see on the bottom here, I have the Z-scores. Again, this is like RSI. And if you remember... Uh, back last year, we were talking about how the formation of divergence was happening here, where we had lower lows for price, but higher lows for the Z-scores. Um, and Z-scores are like a statistical metric that you ask, how far away from the moving average is price? And you could say, well, which moving average? And that's why you can see all oh, there's a bunch of different lines here. It's like six different lines because these all represent different moving averages. Um, so Z-scores will naturally tend towards zero, um, and, and ultimately they act very similarly to RSI. They're like a momentum indicator. So I just wanted to show you guys again, it's been a while since we've looked at Z-scores, that uh, they continue to trend in a positive direction that continues to give us the indication that there's strength, and, uh, strength in these markets. Um, we still got this level right here that's fairly important. That was the first place that price crashed down to um, after the top, uh, which was actually in January. Uh, for maybe it's December, uh, December, January uh, for the S&P and for stocks. So um, I think we did talk about this a couple of weeks ago where we said that this line is important and um, it's probably going to require some consolidation and chop right here uh, before it actually breaks. But when it does, I mean, it's going to be game on directly to this level. And then the real question will be whether or not uh, that level can get broken and we can make it up to kind of like the next major point of resistance. Um, I'll be getting nervous once we get above this area, right? You can see 43.11, 43.24. I'll, I'll be starting to get kind of nervous about definitely taking profits uh, once we get to that level. Uh, and I mean, not in stocks, but just in risk in general, since it's all correlated. Uh, NASDAQ looks very similar.
Um, you can see, again, the Z-scores, you can see they're making higher lows, um, even as uh, lower lows were being made for price. And again, also with the NASDAQ, they kind of broke their main final boss bear market uh, down sloping resistance line, um, stopped at kind of a very natural place um, to expect that price would stop. So everything there looks pretty good. Might just need some consolidation. Um, or for all I know, it could just pump next week, right? That's, that's the point of, of trying to get in at the best entries you can um, and buying when there's blood in the streets. Because if you bought... Uh, if you bought down here or in crypto, if you bought, if you were buying all the way, all the way up on this pump, you're sitting pretty right now. You're like, eh, I'm fine. I can just wait. I don't need to worry about trying to get the best entry or trying to buy the dip. Um, that was the point of buying down here. And now you can just you know, chill. Um, you don't have to worry too much. So nice. you take a quick look at the macro. Uh, look at gold actually first. So <laughs> the funny thing is that when people were talking about that exhaustion wick um, on crypto, uh, when it pumped a couple days ago, I was looking at this gold wick here, um, and especially this most recent one. These are like 100% exhaustion wicks. Oh, I mean, I shouldn't say 100% is trading. Nothing's 100%. Uh, but these look very much like exhaustion wicks to me. So I very much expect gold would come back to the top of this trend line. Um, this was kind of a very important area, as we talked about before. Because not only was this kind of like an interim peak, but if you go all the way back to 2011, um, that was also the top right around there. So gold looks good. It kind of took an unexpected dip. Well, I mean, at least for me, I didn't expect it to dip quite that much. Um, but, you know, it, it's fine. It should continue performing, uh, especially if the rest of risk is performing. We can look at the 10-year yield, and it kind of hit a natural resistance point. Um, what we want to see here is stability. We don't like this going up really quickly. That's not the best kind of action we want to see. If that were to continue, that might be concerning. Or if it like whipsawed back down, that would also be bad. Um, so I think generally what happened with this recent move up is the market is pricing in the Fed raising slightly higher than 5%, even though the Fed didn't say they were going to do that. Uh, but the market, I don't know, they're always they're always trying to guess the Ford guidance. So that's just that's just how those guys are. Uh, look at the dollar index. Uh, this one we broke down, or sorry, broke up through that channel. Um, you remember we talked about that would have been a good opportunity to go down, but um, apparently at this moment, it doesn't necessarily matter that the dollar is stronger than other currencies. Um, crypto and stocks seem to be performing pretty well. So uh, I don't really have any big opinions on what happens here. You know, maybe it could just trend sideways kind of down that line and then continue up, or it could just come up straight away. And uh, I, I really, I don't have any strong opinions on what happens there with the dollar, uh, but it's not necessarily prohibitive to price pumps right now. Uh, all right, we've got oil. Same thing with oil, as we've said for quite a long time now, for the past few months, we really just want it to stay inside this channel. It, it, we want it to be stable. That's good for the economy as well. Um, and then reverse repos, uh, they're basically slowly, barely trending. This almost slightly looks like kind of a bottoming structure. Um, so I don't know. It, it Overall, you would look at this chart and say that this chart is downtrending now. It's in a fresh downtrend. Um, so there's not too much more to say about that chart. And the last thing I want to show you guys is the velocity of money. So imagine, let's suppose you're a waiter and you get some tips. Let's suppose you have $1, <laughs> you have a dollar in tips. Um, and then you pay that dollar to an Uber driver and then that Uber driver goes and buys a hot dog. Um, so that dollar might have changed hands three times that day. So you, would, you might be able to say that dollar has a velocity of three. Um, so the quickness or rapidity of which dollars move through the economy, how often they change hands, that's known as the velocity of money. Now, we saw velocity actually absolutely crater um, with the uh, with the COVID. So, oh crap, I don't know if I should say that. They might kick us off to YouTube. Sorry, I didn't mean it, YouTube. <laughs> but anyways, uh, velocity started to pick up, and that's kind of a sign that the economy is picking up again. It means that people are producing stuff and manufacturing is happening. Um, and you can actually see that this chart has been going down since the late 90s. Um, and I tend to think this is probably because of the hyper financialization of the economy. People, instead of putting money into productive endeavors like business and production manufacturing, they just put it into the financial sector because that's where the most money is to be made. Um, so it's kind of an unfortunate reality of our economy. Um, but perhaps this is a bottom. Um, there's a guy named Russell Napier who has this theory that the government needs to get in uh, get the debt to GDP ratio down. And the only way to do that is to pay for it with inflation. 
So he expects that we're going to have high inflation for quite a long time uh, because this is basically what they did to get debt to GDP down after World War II. And uh, whether that's true or not, I'm not quite sure. But he does say that that will bring back a lot of manufacturing jobs to the U.S. Um, but at any rate, the velocity ticking up here, and you can see this is from October of last year. So we it's like a quarterly report. Um, but I would expect with the economy, the way things look, this should probably keep ticking up. And that's basically a sign that, um, that the economy is continuing to improve. And that's good, right? If we don't see a recession, um, there's less chance that we have some epic crash in the stock market or crypto. So um, yeah, that's kind of where I see things are at right now. Everything looks good. Um, I hope you guys picked up your positions in your shit coins because uh, it's that season, at least temporarily. All right, man. Amazing as always. Very comprehensive. So did you did you end? I know a few weeks ago you had mentioned like uh, Bitcoin was topping out. I think when it hit like when it was nearing twenty five k, were you able to uh, make some good moves there and kind of get out and get back in? I took some profit and um, not on Bitcoin but on uh, shitcoin, and then I went to uh -huh. Poco and uh, and I was like it it actually kept on pumping. It, it pumped so much I was like okay, the responsible thing here to do is to take profit. So I did. And then it pumps some more. And I was like, well, crap. Okay, it just broke a bunch of levels. I'll, I'll get back in on the dip. And then I went to Anarchapoco and I saw it dip down to my uh, my buy level. But, you know, I don't like bring my I don't bring my crypto and my trading stuff. Like yeah, that. that's how it happens. happens. It's always at the worst time, right? Isn't that, yeah. That's what. <sighs> but I got back into it. I fumbled back into it a few days ago. So, okay. Sweet, sweet, sweet. All right, man. Amazing as always. Um, all right. But let's, let's keep it moving. Okay. Yeah. Body, please think... stick around if you can. Thank you I so will. much, Bobby. Appreciate yeah. it. We'll see you next week. Adios. Okay, bye. bye.